what we're going to do now is to look at the categories of things that happen uh, inside the company, because we, you know, as we were looking at the chart before, uh, we were looking at uh, we were looking at it, and we said, okay, it's the activities inside Y that define what is going to be included in income at the U.S. shareholder level. So we're now going to be looking at, okay, what are the rules regarding those activities? What are they? And where do you find them? And this is, you know, some of these I've asked you to read, some of these I've asked you to, to scan. If we look at uh, 954, this is one of your really basic sections. Uh, 954 defines what is called foreign base company income. You'll see in where section 952 defines subpart F income as a term and includes foreign base company income. So 954 is where we find all these, all these rules of what are those categories. And again, these are pretty bright line rules. And they are applied for the most part on a transaction by transaction basis. There's three categories. Okay, first, foreign personal holding company income, which again is your, for the most part, your passive type income, dividends, interest, royalties, and we'll look a little bit more at that in another slide. Foreign based company sales income, which again we'll look at in more detail. And foreign based company services income, which again we'll look at in a little bit more detail. I've spoken before about what is gross income, al apply, allocate expenses, and then come down to a net income figure. All of these detailed rules, which are showing as foreign personal holding company income is defined in 954C, or foreign based company sales income or services income in 954D and E, those are gross income calculations. And again, gross income for, for example, product sales is going to be revenue sales proceeds minus cost of sales. For something like uh, services income, normally it's going to be the amount of the service fee. For interest or royalty, it's going to be the amount of revenue earned before expenses. Now, when you, yes? When you say cost of sales, how is that not, that always confuses me, how is that not expensive? There is a difference in terms of the way things are organized. Now, whether this is right or wrong or Just different, in my head, yeah. What should I be thinking of as cost of sales and? Okay, well, okay, okay no, that's a good question. Uh, cost of, if you're in a, let's let's take two possibilities. One is you're in a manufacturing business. You know, you manufacture a table and you sell it to somebody. Well, under good accounting concepts, the things that go into that cost of sales is going to be cost of manufacturing, uh, or primarily cost of manufacturing, which is going to include uh, the raw material cost, the uh, the labor that goes into that table and allocable uh, factory overhead, the rental on the factory, the uh, cost of uh, supervision over the manufacturing process, the, the light bill, all of those things with respect to the factory 
those go into cost of manufacturing, cost of sales. So what would the expense be? Well, for example, uh, let's say you're in the uh, legal department or the tax department of the corporation. But if you're included in overhead? You're not overhead for the manufacturing process. Now, potentially, if you worked specifically, let's say, doing work on a contract for the purchase of raw materials, okay, maybe some of your time might be allocated to manufacturing overhead. But on a company-wide basis, most of your costs, you know, accounting, sales, administration, uh, legal, all of these things are expenses uh, that are not included in cost of manufacturing. Yeah, there are rules in the code on what goes into the cost of inventory. Now, those are not international rules, but they apply in the international sphere. Gross income is, again, for a manufactured item or for, you know, if I'm a wholesaler in tables, I buy it and resell it. Revenue, sales proceeds, less my cost of either manufacturing this or purchasing it. That's gross income for this purpose. If I uh, if I have a piece of real estate and I sell the piece of real estate, gross income is going to be my sales proceeds minus whatever my cost basis is in that, in that uh, real estate. Uh, again, the point from the standpoint of this statutory framework is that, again, when we look at these rules on what is foreign personal holding company income, services income, and uh, sales income. Uh, when we look at those rules, we apply them to gross income. The allocation of expenses is done later uh, when we, uh, in a sense, go from, uh, from these definitions to foreign-based company income uh, which then goes to into subpart F income. This is just statutorily how it's constructed. Now let's uh, uh, look uh, at a vanilla example of foreign personal holding company income. Uh, the CFC owns a bond issued by another unrelated company. It earns interest income. Uh, that's included in foreign personal holding company income. It will then become foreign base company income, which is then included in subpart F income. Now, what has happened, uh, you know, some of you, for example, uh, uh, are working with, uh, are looking at uh, Apple. They have very adroitly sidestepped subpart F on all of their sales of products. They sell a lot of products. They earn a lot of, uh, re a lot of gross income. But the gross income from those sale of products, they have avoided, they've avoided uh, any inclusion in foreign based company sales income. And we'll talk later a little bit about that. But they accumulate cash from this that has been sitting in an Irish company. Okay, the interest and the dividends and any other income from that, you know, roughly 200 billion of cash that has been sitting there, that will be ultimately subpart F income, taxable on a current basis to Apple in the United States under the subpart F mechanism. Even if they don't, so it, because it's passive payments, even if they don't reinvest it immediately into ongoing business? That's right, they haven't had much to invest it in. I mean, they just build up the cash and they have dividends and interest on that invested cash. And it's redeployed back into the... Oh, if it's redeployed back into active business, of course, 
it's not. But as long as it just sits there and earns passive income, okay, that passive income is within one of these defined categories, uh, which is ends up being currently taxed at the U.S. Apple level. Okay, when we finished class last time, uh, we had just uh, started talking about uh, what makes up foreign-based company income. And as you'll recall, foreign-based company income is, as a practical matter, the most important component of subpart F income. And we had spoken a little bit about foreign personal holding company income, and we said that was dividends, interest, rents, royalties, uh, all sorts of things like that. <clears throat> uh, I don't think we had gotten to uh, to this particular slide, which uh, indicates a number of the other items that are included, uh, gains from sale ex or exchange of property, uh, transactions and commodities, foreign currency transactions, uh, notional principal contracts. Anybody know what a notional principal contract is? Anybody ever heard of a swap? Okay, what's a swap? When you exchange one currency to another. Well, that that could be uh, uh, a notional currency, or I'm sorry, a notional uh, principal contract is something that, in a sense, between two parties, uh, not uh, normally in the real world, not related parties, they uh, want to change the risk, maybe. Uh, maybe I'm doing most of my business, like you say, in one currency, uh, the U.S. dollar, but somebody else wants to get paid uh, in the currency of their country so that I have an obligation to that other person in a different currency. Well, these are contracts that will shift risk from one party to another uh, with respect to something. Could be interest rates, could be the fluctuations in currency. So, I mean, th that's what it is. It's a whole subject of its own, but it is uh, it is something that you see from time to time. Uh, anyway, uh, foreign personal holding company income, it's a major category of uh, foreign-based company income, major part of uh, subpart F income. We'll talk uh, a little bit later about a couple of uh, special areas in, in this foreign-based company income, which I think uh, uh, are worth talking about, but we'll defer them until uh, later. Uh, the next category of foreign-based uh, foreign company income is foreign-based company uh, sales income. Uh, here, as you can see, a vanilla example, domestic parent sells an item of property, maybe it's manufactured that property, uh, to its CFC, and the CFC sells the product to an unrelated customer in another country. The CFC is in country A, the customer is in country B. Now. There can be all sorts of legitimate reasons why a group might want to structure something like this, but irrespective of all of the wonderful non-tax reasons why this is a, uh, a good idea, the relatively black and white rules of subpart F just define this as a transaction which will generate subpart F income. The logic behind it is that, well, if the product being purchased and resold is coming from one country, going to another country, neither of which is the CFC's country of incorporation, then well, gee, why, why put that transaction 
through country A, which in a manner of speaking is a third country having nothing to do with it. So in a blanket way, they just, they just say, hey, this kind of transaction, we drop it into this box, and it creates subpart F income. Now, I'm speaking generally, what are these black and white rules, and how can we attempt to uh, how can we attempt to turn them into some sort of a uh, more easily remembered phrase? There's two, two principal things that you can remember. One is, with respect to the CFC, a related party is involved, which we're going to say is X up here. A related party is involved. And related means over 50%. Secondly, okay, I said one, uh, a related party is involved. And then two, the point of origination and point of destination are outside the country of incorporation. So origination, destination, outside country of incorporation. Here we see that the customer is outside the country of incorporation. The origination of the product was in the United States, which is where X is, because we're assuming, of course, X is a US company, manufacturing the product, selling it to the CFC, and the CFC then sells it to the customer. So point of origination, point of destination, outside the country of incorporation. If you just keep those two principles in mind, related in some manner, and point of origination, point of destination, outside the country of incorporation, then you've got 95% of what you need to know. The CFC in many situations, of course, will be the one that's buying and reselling. But it can also be acting as an agent for uh, something that X sells, for example, so that it earns agency fees instead of uh, gross profit from buying and reselling. <laughs> uh, but in any case, it's, uh, it's broadly written, but it's Again, very black and white uh, for most cases. Now, there's a couple of exceptions that override, and we'll cover those a little bit later uh, in, our, uh, in our discussion. Now, the next and final, uh, final uh, part of uh, foreign-based company income is foreign-based company services income very similar to what we talk about with foreign-based company sales income is that you can say there's a related party involved and the services are conducted outside the country of incorporation. Related party involved, services are outside the country of incorporation. So if we look at our simple example here, our vanilla example, the domestic parent has contracted with some customer uh, to perform some services in this one construction of a highway. But the domestic parent doesn't do all of the work itself. It subcontracts a portion of the work to its CFC, which is incorporated somewhere outside the United States. So the CFC performs these services uh, in uh, helping construct the highway. So in this case, the CFC is doing something, doing services. A related party is involved. And in this case, the services are performed outside of the country of incorporation. Now, if the 
unrelated customer required services that were performed within the country of incorporation, then of course it would not be uh, you know, a foreign based company services income. The, again, you know, if you sort of sit, stand back and say, uh, what's the logic? Well, if the domestic parent has a subsidiary in France and that French subsidiary takes care of services in France, even though it's for, you know, the, in a sense, on behalf of the parent, well, that makes sense. The services are being performed where the subsidiary is, uh, is incorporated. It doesn't sound like there's any tax motivation in doing this. It makes good sense. But if that project is somewhere else, if it requires the personnel of the CFC to go to that other country and perform the services there, then that gets caught. So again, very black and white uh, sort of rule that catches pretty much everybody. The, uh, uh, for example, if you, you know, as a parent company, they uh, subcontract to their uh, Japanese Japan company and they uh, allow the J Japan company to go to China because they are beside each other to do their construction, then... It, it still gets caught. Yeah. Now, it still gets caught and then this gets to some other exceptions which we'll talk about later. Uh, a Japanese, uh, J Japan, using your example, has a very high tax rate. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem like you know, a good way to avoid taxes to subcontract to a Japanese company that will then work in China. So as we'll see in a, in a moment or two, yeah, there's a high tax exception. If, you know, if the Japanese tax is high enough, then uh, that will overcome this, this situation. But the more common thing, of course, would be that maybe they use a Hong Kong company yeah. Yeah. to do that work in, mm -hmm. uh, in China. And Hong Kong has a lower tax rate. Mm -hmm. And it's not arguable because it's yeah, convenience, right? Well, the, I mean, there's lots of business reasons mm -hmm. for using, and again, this is where I'm saying the the tax rules are black and white here, even though there are all the business reasons in the world to, uh, to, in a sense, service the China market from Hong Kong. There are so many good reasons. I mean, I've had the wonderful good fortune to live and work in Hong Kong. Yeah, well, you know, China's right there. And uh, there's really, there, there's good reason for it. Tax rules don't care. Now, I'm surprised that one of you hasn't brought up the question, well, uh, gee, uh, isn't Hong Kong a part of China? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, I heard, I heard two, uh, first a tentative, and then a, <laughs> and of course. Uh, yes, Michael? So what, British, I think, didn't they just? No, it, it's, it, it's, it ended, it ended, what, like, 1997. 1997. Yeah, yeah. yeah. recently. Wait, wouldn't, wait, is Macau 99? Yeah, Macau, Macau is 99, yeah. right. Yeah, so legally, as far as, yes, everybody is concerned, China and Hong Kong are two, are, are, is one country. The tax rules don't care. Uh, because they have different tax systems, they are still considered, for subpart F purposes, two different countries. Mm -hmm. I can remember being in Hong Kong in the late 70s and the changeover to China, I mean, that was just so far in the future, I couldn't imagine it. Uh, yes, Patience. Is there anything similar, I don't know enough about the sovereignty of the UAE, but because they have separate economic zones like in Dubai that have possibly different tax laws, do you encounter a similar thing where the Dubai yeah. financial center is treated as a separate uh, uh, that's, that's a good. That's a good question. I have never seen anything on it, and it, it never has come up in my practice. Uh, yeah, whether one emirate 
uh, versus another emirate or two different countries. My guess is that maybe they are. Depending on their tax laws. Well, for some part, F it would be. Well, uh, I don't know enough about what legally the structure, the right. legal okay. structure of the emirates is, and as a result, I, you know, I I don't know enough to be able to uh, say one way or the other, but it's. It's definitely something that Treasury and the IRS would uh, would make a decision on as to whether they are the same country or two different or seven different countries. I think what is it? There's seven Emirates. Yeah. Uh, so taking it back to Asia, like um, Shenzhen, China, where you have a special economic zone like that, that is not relevant to this. That's not country. relevant to this. Okay. Uh, the uh, the fact that there is a special economic zone within uh, Shenzhen or you know other areas, uh, uh, that's still part of the mainland. We've established that there are three categories of foreign-based company uh, income, and we've said that their foreign-based company. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, foreign personal holding company income, foreign base company sales income, foreign base company services income. And we also discussed last week that, uh, that the three of them are gross income concepts. Okay, now we look at some rules that are found in 954B which look at those three and which affect how they then either get into or don't get into uh, into subpart F income itself. The first one is uh, what I'll call a de minimis rule. It's basically saying, you know, we know that all of the subpart F nonsense is a lot of detail and a lot of pain and suffering Therefore, if it's, if it's below some de minimis amount, then you can just forget about it and not worry about it. So that de minimis, de minim, uh, excuse me, that de minimis amount uh, is the lesser of 5% of gross income or $1 million. So you uh, you have to just look at those tests on a CFC by CFC basis and decide. So you may not be troubled by subpart F if the CFC has just a small amount of uh, foreign-based company income. The second is, of course, not de minimis, but if it's so much, we won't worry about the details and we'll just say all of the gross income is, uh, is um, uh, covered and becomes subpart F income. And that rule essentially says if your foreign based company income is more than 70% of gross income, then 100% will be treated as foreign based company income. And you know, so those those make some, some, some amount of sense. The next one, which, is, uh, which, has, uh, which has become more important, uh, is this rule, which is found in, uh, again, 954B. And it's essentially saying that, and we, this gets us back to, I think, the Japanese, uh, yeah. you know, the Japanese subsidiary that's performing services in China. Well, if Japan is taxing that company so high, you know, uh, there was no intent to avoid taxation, therefore we won't treat it as subpart F. Interestingly though, the way the regulations were written on this it is actually optional to the taxpayer as to whether they claim this or not. 
So maybe we have the situation in Japan. Uh, anybody know roughly what the Japanese tax rate is at the moment uh, on corporate earnings? Give or take a bit. I think it's around 35% these days. Uh, I'm not sure where. There's been, it's moved down from uh, higher levels, but it certainly is much more than the current US 21% rate. Is there any reason why we might want to have subpart F income? Let's say we have our situation uh, which uh, you've suggested, which is a US company at the top and a Japanese subsidiary, and then some customer over here in China. Anyway, the, the, long, the long and short is let's assume that there's a 35% tax rate here, there's a 21% tax rate here, and of course the Japanese company is sending its personnel out uh, and they perform the services in China. We will again talk more about it later, but we uh, about the deemed paid credit in this, uh, later in the uh, this subpart of context. But we have talked previously uh, last week about the foreign tax credit, and we've talked about deemed paid credits. If there's a 35% tax in Japan, and the U.S. Uh, tax is 21%. If the U.S. has to recognize on a current basis, because this is subpart F income, if the U.S. parent has to recognize income on a current basis and get taxed at 21 uh, percent, what happens with that 35 deemed paid tax credit? Excess. Are you going to whisper it, or are you going to speak it out loud? <laughs> yeah, you have an excess foreign tax credit. Yes. Perfect. In other words, there's more foreign tax than U.S. tax. So, and remember, what could we do with that? We can carry back. We can carry forward. But even before we get to that, we always talk in class to keep things simpler. We always talk in class as if the only asset or activity that the U.S. company has is, is its, its ownership of the Japanese subsidiary. The U.S. parent probably has 10 other business lines. Well, maybe some of them generate uh, foreign source income. And maybe, yes, now you're oh, right, they have foreign tax credit limitation that's not being utilized because, at least for that other foreign source income, maybe it's low taxed or not taxed at all by any other foreign country. So there can be an immediate benefit for the U.S. company to uh, to recognize income under subpart F, bring the deemed paid tax credit back into the U.S. tax return, and as a result, reduce its U.S. tax on other foreign source low taxed income. So there can often be a benefit. Now, today, uh, or let's say before the uh, recent tax act, uh, this was something which you wouldn't see too often, but you would see occasionally. I've mentioned several times, and again, we're going to talk about what the guilty rules are next week as opposed to this week, but uh, I have mentioned with respect to the guilty rules that there's a separate foreign tax credit a uh, basket for them under 904D. I've also mentioned that there's no carry back or carry forward for excess foreign tax credits that are in the guilty basket. Today, you'd rather have income sometimes in the, uh, if it's income, if it's high, it's subject to high foreign taxes, you'd rather have it 
in a subpart F basket, so to speak, than in the guilty basket. You'd rather, uh, let me rephrase that to be uh, a little more correct. You'd rather have uh, something treated as income in the US under subpart F, which causes it to be in the general overall foreign tax credit basket and not in the guilty foreign tax credit basket. If it's in the guilty basket, there's two problems. Number one, that carry back, lack of any carry back and carry forward. And then secondly, there's a 20% haircut, which we'll mention in a, uh, in a few minutes. So today, there's actually, in some cases, companies in this kind of situation where there's high foreign taxes in a subsidiary, looking at it and saying, gee, can we somehow make this subpart F? Before the recent, you know, December 2017 tax legislation, you always wanted to avoid subpart F any way you could. Now there are situations where you would prefer it. Darcy? I feel like I heard you wrong at the beginning of that. If you're a U.S. corporation and you have a lot of entities that are foreign, you can't you honestly just kind of allocate what you're not using in your foreign credit in one to another one of your entities? Is that what you said? Well, no, no, not to the entities. I mean, but to the extent that your return in the U.S. shows a foreign credit, you should allocate it to any of your entities at the moment? That can't be right. Well, no, no, it's not an allocation to entities. Okay. Let's say that this U.S. company has a, you know, a domestic subsidiary and they file a consolidated tax return. They are treated as one taxpayer uh, for foreign tax credit purposes. So the distinction between entities within the U.S. is not important. Now, there may, yes, be... 500 more foreign subsidiaries. But for the most part, each one is treated as a separate CFC, assuming it's not a disregarded entity, which again puts us into a different uh, place. But for any foreign subsidiary, uh, it's going to be treated separately. Now, when we talk about other income that the U.S. group, in other words, the, the uh, U.S. companies, uh, members of the group that file a consolidated return, they're all U.S. companies. If we look at all of the businesses that they're in, some of them are earning low-taxed foreign source income that create, in a sense, the ability, the excess limitation the ability to absorb more foreign taxes and reduce the U.S. tax. Um, it's uh, the businesses in the other CFCs don't affect this, except to the extent that there's subpart F income from another one. Okay, let's assume that let's assume that this one uh, in the green here. Uh, I'm, this one here. Let's assume this one uh, is in a uh, is in a tax haven with zero tax, and let's assume that it has uh, some subpart F income that is currently recognized up here. I think I mentioned during the foreign tax credit discussion that we have a global limitation calculation. We include all of the, uh, in other words, we include income, taxable income in that formula, foreign source taxable income over worldwide taxable income. We include foreign source taxable income from all countries, as long as it's within the same basket, uh, you know, under the, uh, the basket rules. So if it's in the same basket, they offset. So if you have, a, if you have uh, foreign taxes from a high tax country, uh, and if you have more foreign source income from a low or zero tax country, they, in a sense, come together and they average. 
and effectively you use the foreign tax credits, the excess foreign tax credits from the high tax country to reduce the U.S. tax that would otherwise be applied to the income from the low tax country. So, you know, if we have if we have a hundred of income uh, that's recognized at the U.S. level under subpart F from the tax haven company, and if we have a hundred of income from the Japanese company that's recognized under subpart F by the U.S. parent, and there's that 35 tax, we have 200 of income, 200 times 21 is 42. Okay, so we have U.S. tax before foreign tax credit of 42. We have paid 35 of tax in other words, through the deemed paid credit mechanism. We've paid, the U.S. company is treated as having paid 35 of tax. So we're able to use all of that 35 against the 42 and we pay only seven extra to the U.S. government. Now that's called cross-crediting, cross-crediting. Uh, this has been a major goal of U.S. groups to effectively manage uh, the relative levels of taxation in their subsidiaries, the recognition of income when either they bring mo uh, money home back when we had the deferral system, or now when we bring money back, uh, I'm sorry, not when we bring, now under the new system, uh, under either subpart F or, or guilty. And this is with these you know, terrible results where you have guilty uh, with respect to the foreign tax credit. This is driving companies to think about, gee, are we better off where we have high foreign taxes to somehow may come within these bright line tests of what is foreign personal holding company income, foreign base sales company, uh, foreign uh, base company sales income, foreign base company services income. Can we get in there? Because if we can, we're not subject to these two terrible guilty restrictions, the 20% haircut and the no carry back, no carry forward. Now, within guilty, there's the same sort of ability to cross credit. So if you have guilty from a high tax country, if you have guilty from a low tax or zero tax country, then those can offset and cross credit, but only within the one year, not going back, not going forward. So I just want to uh, confirm that the high tax uh, exception is not available when I want to use the excess credit, right? The high tax exception. It still be considered as sub, sub F, even it won't be a sub F when I use the exception. Can oh, okay, yes, it, right. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you, if you have a uh, yeah, right. If you have a situation like this with uh, Japan at thirty-five percent, you have a choice. If you do nothing, and we have, of course, J Japan earning only subpart F income, then uh, it comes up and there's a, uh, a, an inclusion in the U.S. income and a deemed paid tax credit that follows it up. Uh, if you don't use the exception, that's the general rule, it applies. But if you have some reason for wanting to use the exception, then you go through the procedure to use the exception and you do not have subpart F income recognized at the U.S. shareholder level. Uh, yeah, the, the, again, the point to carry away is that this, this is maybe becoming more important because of the new law, because of the guilty situation. Also, the fact that the tax rate now at 21% uh, means that more often there will probably be excess credits. And, you know, 
if there are excess credits, companies want to try to use them. And if you think about uh, that formula, foreign source taxable income over worldwide taxable income times U.S. tax before credit, you know, how can I, within that U.S. group, increase my foreign source taxable income? Uh, you know, within the same basket, uh, and yeah. so on. So th this this is be it is becoming more important uh, because of these uh, changes in the uh, December 2017 law. Uh, notice also, uh, I, I didn't mention uh, the effective rate of foreign tax. There was the the uh, this rule comes into play when the effective rate of foreign tax is greater than 90% of the U.S. rate. So 90% of 21% uh, percent, uh, is 18.9%. So that's the magic number. If, for example, you had a 19% 19, 19 effective tax rate, then there would be a benefit of 2% to make this election and treat it not as subpart F income because you would, uh, you would avoid uh, the extra you know, U.S. tax from, uh, that's above that uh, 19%. Okay, the third item, which is in Section 954B, uh, and again, this gets back to uh, you know, gross income versus uh, uh, after expenses. Uh, 954B5, is essentially saying, okay, to the against the gross income that you've calculated for these three categories of foreign based company income, now you figure out how much in the way of expenses should be allocated against them and uh, come up with a number that will then uh, move uh, into subpart F income and eventually be. Uh, part of uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, part of the U.S. shareholders' income. Now, this area, I suspect you, those of you who took uh, international tax one, should have again seen at least some of these allocation rules uh, have been introduced to the their existence. Again, they go on for pages and pages and pages. So I doubt that you got into them, they generally reflect good accounting concepts on how to allocate uh, expenses across different classes of income. Uh, the point is, understand that they exist, because when they become important, you will know where to look. If you just remember the 861-8 and following, <laughs> you know, and subsequent sections in the regulations. Uh, that's, uh, I think, what's most important at this point. Uh, and these rules are used a lot of places in the code. So uh, it's, uh, I think, important to be aware that they exist. You know, I, I, I agree we don't need, and nor do we want to, uh, get into the details of how you allocate expenses, but uh, they are there. <laughs>